Let's, uh, let's go to Ross chapter 10. This is page 86 in your book. So you can go ahead and flip your, your book open to that point. Let me also encourage you to grab the handouts. If uh, you don't have them in front of you or I haven't given them to you, you can get them on my web page uh, under course handouts. So here's what, uh, here's what the first one looks like that I'm going to want to go through. If you go down a little further, let's see. <clears throat> on, my ha- on my website, there's also a practice sheet for the, the personal endings of the perfect verb. You can use these to practice writing the endings. And then there's also a sheet for that gives you the root letters of the verb, and you can practice writing the vowels inside the three root letters as well as the endings that we're going to be talking about today. And then there's a little practice sheet. I'm going to go through this in a little bit. A practice sheet for identifying the endings on the verbs, the suffixes. So we'll, we'll talk about what all that means uh, shortly here. All right. So let's talk about <clears throat> Hebrew verbs here for a minute. The Hebrew verbal system is going to be a little bit maddening to you simply from the standpoint that English will seem a lot simpler to you, at least uh, from the outset. And then there's going to be some ways that the Hebrew verbal system functions that's not exactly like the way English does it, and uh, we just have to get used to it. It's, uh, It's not even exactly the way Greek does it, so if you've done some Greek, you may uh, be longing for Greek for a few weeks, but, but, but then I think you'll settle into Hebrew here and how the verbal system works. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the Hebrew language is really, really interesting, and we've seen some features of this uh, already a little earlier, in that, uh, for the most part, the Hebrew language is built off of what are called um, triliteral or triconsonantal Roots. Remember, mem, lamed, kaf, which uh, we had an occasion to, to to consider might be a uh, a biblical prophecy of Martin Luther King Jr., but probably not. Uh, MLK, Melek, means what? King, right? So. We, we use certain vowels with that pattern, and we get a word associated with this idea of kingship, melech. Uh, we change the vowels to other vowels and maybe add some prefixes and suffixes. Then we have different words, but they're still related to the semantic domain of what the three root letters are in the sequence that they're found. Here's another MLK, but this is the word malkuth. Uh, Melech means king. Malkut means kingdom. kingdom. Okay? Malka means queen. And again, it's using the same three root letters. And those are, are, are all within the domain of reigning uh, and so forth. Dominion, kingdom. And, and uh, such like. So it shouldn't come as a surprise to us when we come to the Hebrew verbal system that the Hebrew verbal system is going to also be built off of a triliteral or triconsonantal system for the most part. We will come across some forms that are biconsonantal, that use just two root letters instead of three. And uh, those are often referred to as weak verbs. Uh, we'll get to those in second semester Hebrew. For now, we're going to focus our attention on the triconsonantal forms. Uh, When we start uh, getting hot and heavy into these verbs, you're going to be asked to do something called parsing. Now, if you've done any Greek and if you're farther along in Greek, you already know of this concept. To parse a form is, is to provide all the grammatical information about the form. Uh, For example, you can parse verbs, but you can also parse nouns. If I had something like uh, a a noun like this, or a form like this, b-melachim, okay? I do have a problem with these two vocal shavas side by side, 
b malakim. And so I would have to vocalize that using the red writer solution, right? And I have bim lahim. Now, if I told you, please, please parse this form, what are you going to do for me? Well, you're going to want to account for everything that makes up this form. And that would include any prefixes that are attached as prepositions and also what the actual ending is. So how would I parse this? Well, I would say this is the preposition bet, right? Because that is the preposition bet, plus the masculine plural form of, and then I'm going to give the lexical form, which is the singular form that you've learned when you learn this as a vocabulary word, which is melek. Okay? So the first part is identifying the the be, the be. MP identifies the im, Melek identifies what the middle is if it were uninflected, if there wasn't an ending at it. Okay? So, so that, that's how you would parse an, a noun form that, say, has a preposition. If all I had was Melekim, then my parsing would just be masculine plural of Melek. Okay? But we're also going to parse verbs. And when you parse verbs, you're going to have to give some information and we're going to learn that information in this first uh, handout. Uh, in Hebrew, we have roots, stems, conjugation patterns, and then um, person, gender, number. The word root is referring to the triconsonantal root letters, the three consonants. Okay? So if I had a verb like um, pakada. I've got on this form, which uh, would be translated as she appointed or visited, I would, uh, if I were parsing, I'd want to indicate the root letters. So root means what are the three consonants? So what are the three consonants here? Pe, kov, dalit. Stem. There are seven stems. We are learning the first stem today. And the first stem is called the cal stem. Okay. So that would be the second bit of information I would get. When you think of stems, if you've learned some language, maybe in Spanish or French or Italian or German or something like that, the word stem is used differently for those Romance languages and Germanic languages, Indo-European languages, uh, compared to when we use the word stem for Hebrew. Okay, uh, Stem has to do with how the subject is related to the verbal action, whether the subject is active or passive whether the subject is um, causing someone to do an action or being caused to do an action. And uh, there, again, as I mentioned, there are seven stems. Uh, so the stems are a, uh, a verbal pattern. They are not what typically is thought of in stems, where in Spanish, if you had the word hablo, we might say that the stem of hablo is habla, habla. And the O is the, uh, the ending that indicates the subject, okay? That is not what we mean by stem in Hebrew. Basically, what we mean by stem in Spanish language is what in Hebrew would we would refer to as the roots. Okay, so the roots are the consonants that make up the uh, the semantic uh, the semantics of the verb, what the nature of the action is. Okay, stem has to do with a completely different category. Uh, we'll, we'll go into this more fully when we get to chapter 26. But right now, every time we parse a verb and think about a verb, it's always going to be in what's called the cal stem. And the cal stem basically is telling us that the subject is the doer of the action. Okay? In the cal stem, the subject does the action. Uh, that's very simpl simplistic right now, but, but that, that will at least help you. With the next stem we learn will be called the nifal stem, and there the subject will not do the action, but the action will be done to the subject. Passive idea. Uh, okay, now, uh, the next thing is called the conjugation. Uh, there are several conjugation patterns. We're going to learn in this chapter something called the perfect conjugation. And uh, so for right now, for the next couple of chapters, the answer is always going to be cal perfect if I ask you to parse a verb. Okay? We'll talk about perfect versus imperfect uh, as we go along. But then person, gender, and number 
Person refers to first, second, or third person. So person is one, two, or three. Gender is masculine, feminine, or common. And number is singular versus plural. Okay? <clears throat> Let's talk about these, uh, these ideas here. Oh, actually, <clears throat> let me go ahead and I'll just fill out the parsing of pakada. Okay, the way I would parse this is that it is the root letters pakad, pekof dalit. It's the cow perfect, the cow stem perfect conjugation, and the person gender number is third person feminine and singular because she is a third person feminine singular entity. <clears throat> All right, now, let's, uh, let's put some meat on the skeleton here of what we've just talked about. Let's talk about person. Um, <clears throat> in Hebrew, when we conjugate verbs... That is, when we lay out all the forms of a verb in a particular conjugation, uh, we are going to start with the third person and work our way down to the first person. We'll put the singular forms on the left, usually plural forms on the right. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, the person distinctions have to do with um, who the speaker is, who the addressee is, and then who is not the speaker or the addressee. So to, to, to maybe put it another way, when we think of first person, first person is the speaker. If I say, I love Hebrew, who, who is the I there? Dr. Marshall, right? Because Dr. Marshall is the speaker. So anytime the speaker is speaking and the speaker says I, the referent of the I, the, the, who the I refers to is the speaker. Now, the speaker can be one person, in which case it's, it's I, but the speaker could also include other people along with the speaker. So if I'm speaking for all the guys, let's say, you know, all my students in Houston, and I said something like, we love Hebrew, then who does the we refer to? It refers to the speaker and everybody who's with the speaker, right? The we. And, but that's still first person, but it's now first person plural, not first person singular. Now, in, in English, um, all of our first and second person uh, pronouns are, are what we call common. That is to say, we don't distinguish gender. So if I'm a man, I use the pronoun I. If I'm a woman, I don't have a separate pronoun, I. I still use I. If we're a group of men, we say we. And if we're a group of women, we still say we. Okay? And that's true in Hebrew. So the, uh, the verb is going to be marked for the subject, the doer of the action, with a personal ending in Hebrew that is common when it's first person singular. And that's what the C stands for. So the first common singular personal ending on a perfect verb uh, means the I could be any gender. There's no specific gender that that ending has to, um, to match. And if we're doing something, I'm going to use a common plural ending on that verb to, to indicate that we are doing it. Now, my second person forms, the concept of second person is that if there's a speaker, then there must be an addressee. Who the speaker's talking to. And who the speaker talks to is always the you in an IU dialogue. The, um, the, whoever the I's and the U's refer to are context dependent. So if um, Benjamin Freeman says, I love Hebrew, then who does the I refer to? It refers to Benjamin. But if Dr. Marshall says, I love Hebrew, that same pronoun, I, is used in English, but that doesn't refer to Benjamin anymore. It refers to Dr. Marshall because Dr. Marshall's the speaker of that, that utterance. Okay? If I say something like, you love Hebrew, then who's the you? Well, it depends on who I'm talking to, right? So, so the content, as it were, of I's and you's are moving targets, but that's, that's the nature of, of pronouns and personal endings. You have to know the context and know who, who they refer to. Now, if you look here at the chart, uh, we can indicate who the doer of the action is using second masculine singular forms of our verb at the end. Th these are going to be suffixes that we add. 
We could use second feminine singular forms. So the you can be specific to male or female, uh, singular. And then we also can speak of you doing something where it's a second masculine plural form that's used. And that's going to be for you men or you mixed group or you women. We'll have different forms for all four of these. In English, we just say you did something, right? You ate. And we don't have different forms for whether the you is one or plural or masculine or feminine. So, we're, so Hebrew verbs will give us, uh, in many cases, more specific information than English verbs do. And when you translate a Hebrew verb, sometimes you're going to know more about the Hebrew verb than your English listener is going to know. Because the English listener doesn't know whether that's a you male or a you female, or a you plural or a you singular. So, I, we, first person, you, second person, typically you singular is you, and here in Texas, you plural is not you. It's y'all. Y'all. Now, I'm, I'm curious to know, does anybody come from a place in the United States where y'all actually belongs over here on the singular side. Do you know people that refer to y'all as one you? Georgia. In Georgia. Of course, Georgia does that, don't they? I had a friend from South Africa who um, actually uh, you know, grew up speaking British English in, in the school that he, he learned, learned English. And um, he was driving through some southern city on business. I, I don't know whether it was Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, but he was going through the South. He stopped at a little convenience store uh, to get some gas and walks in to pay. And there's this sweet little Southern lady uh, behind the counter. And he walks in all by himself. And she says, how y'all doing today? And he turns and looks around and he says, I'm sorry, are you talking to me? She says, yeah, I'm talking to y'all. He said, I'm sorry. I thought y'all meant more than one me. And she says, oh, no. Around here, if it's one of you, it's y'all. And if it's more than one of you, we say all y'all. <laughs> so there you go. So in some places, you plural is not y'all, it's all y'all. And y'all is the singular form of you. So you got to know your English here, don't you? <clears throat> okay. Now, we can also specify who the um, doer of the action is if it's anybody but the speaker or the addressee. So I'm just going to put here everyone else, okay? Anyone that's not an I, we, or you, or y'all is by definition third person. He, she, it, or they do something if it's not I, we, or you do something. So... Uh, we can specify on the end of our Hebrew verb a, a, a suffix, a perfect conjugation suffix that indicates that the doer is a third masculine singular uh, entity. So that would be a he or an it did it, okay? Or a third feminine singular entity, and that we would translate that as she or it. Now, why am I using it here? Doesn't it sound like a neuter word? Well, well clearly it is, but does Hebrew have a neuter gender for its noun? No, we only have masculine or feminine. So things that we would consider its will still have a masculine or a feminine gender. And so think about the word ear. Ear, remember ear is the word for city. Is that masculine or feminine? Yeah, it's feminine singular. So if I wanted to say something like the city welcomed the king, which form what I have to use at the end of the verb, I would use the third feminine singular ending because city is feminine singular, okay? And then if I want to refer to a they as doing an action, I have a single form that does double duty for masculine and feminine they, and that's why it's called the third common plural, okay? So here we're just thinking about the, the distinctions between first, second, and per, uh, third person. We'll get to the actual uh, personal endings uh, now. Okay, so let's let's take a look here.